this crusade, this war on terrorism, uh, is going to take a while. This crusade, this war on terrorism, uh, is going to take a while. And the American people must be patient. You can see in the foreground the flags of the 117 member states which are flying. And now the car approaches the door. This surely is a moment which will live in the memory of those who witness it. Pope Paul VI, the spiritual leader of more than half a billion people all over the face of the earth, inheritor of a lineage of 2,000 years, is greeted in this house by the chief representative of a world organization made up of member nations who can count over two billion people of many kinds and many creeds, an organization which man brought into being 20 years ago. His Holiness descends, is greeted by the United Nations Chief of Protocol, who of course met him at Kennedy Airport this morning. The Secretary General awaits inside the threshold of the United Nations building. Hello and welcome everybody to the 50th reading and discussion of the wonderful book End Time Delusions that Steve Wahlberg wrote in the beginning of the 21st century and Tom Fress from Inquisition Update accompanies me in all these 50 last readings we did together and I'm very glad that I can welcome brother Tom Fress from over the big ocean once again connected via Skype to me to come to the table and do the 50th reading of the book and the second of chapter 20 which is called something with the virus if I'm not mistaken yeah the path of the virus hello brother Tom welcome hello to the hello you're good to be here and uh, hello to the listeners and I hope we uh, can uh, make some uh, revelation to people and uh, give them reason to uh, if for nothing else, purchase this book and read it for themselves. Our commentary, I believe, and I don't mean to be uh, gratuitous here, but uh, I think our comment about this book is invaluable. And for those who may not quite yet understand the importance of it, I think if they continue in their study of uh, of, uh, of historicism and the and how uh, erroneous. Uh, futurism is, they'll grow more and more appreciative of uh, our lengthy, sometimes very lengthy commentary on this book. But uh, the book is for sale. You can get it uh, in the, all the normal, usual places. And if nothing else, uh, Google Steve uh, Wolberg's name and uh, get a copy of it for yourself and read it for yourself. And uh, uh, very much uh, appreciate Steve Wolberg and his efforts to write this book. And as I said before in the very beginning, uh, you know, when asked by people, Tom, why why don't you write a book? I've I've already I've already said that uh, uh, the book that I would write has already been written by Steve Wolberg. And I'm not a Jew, and I'm not a Seventh Day Adventist, and uh, but still, uh, there would be very little difference between my book and Steve Wolberg's book. 
Well, I, ju I just have to interrupt you there, Tom, and I have to say uh, <laughs> when you when you speak of our discussion of that book and our adding to it by uh, putting a, here and there a little twist on the view that Steve Wahlberg gives or even widen the view that, that he says and that these comments and discussions make this book more valuable, I think that would probably be the book that you write, but that would probably be about, I don't know, 5,600 pages or so. And nobody's going to read that. So <laughs> That's right. it's easier for the people who are lazy to read themselves to yeah. sit in front of a screen and watch our reading. And by that, they can read along and they can yeah. skip over our comments if they don't like it and just take the book and read it for themselves. Sure. Or they can enjoy our reading and discussion of it. And I think, yeah. as you said, that our discussion of the book uh, will give them even a wider view of the subject, which is very interesting and very important. And without any further ado, Tom, I suggest yeah. we go right into it. Okay? Let's, let's roll. Okay, let's rock and roll. <laughs> The Path of the Virus is the, uh, uh, is the chapter 20 called, and we started already here on this page 126 last time, and we ended here in the page uh, further, uh, which is page uh, 126, as you can see, and shortly, here we have to pick it up for today. So, shortly after the Council of Trent, that we have been discussing last time and other times, but I still will put a little reminder of the picture here. Shortly after the Council of Trent, the Counter-Reformational Council of Trent, the council that was finally given to Martin Luther after asking for 25 years for another council, they gave it to him and one year in he died and it is the first council that was completely led and overshadowed by the new founded Jesuit order. After this council, with the blessing of the Antichrist Pope, Francisco Rabira masterminded the virus the virus of futurism. For the next 300 years, his Jesuit cohorts did their best to insert this virus into Protestant churches, especially through educational processes connected with the universities of Europe, but they failed. Protestants were too smart and they consistently blocked futurism's entrance. In addition, so effective Holy Ghost firewall and virus protection, the, they basically said, quote, sorry, we don't open foreign attachments. But in the 1800s, they dropped their guard. And that is exactly the point Tom always makes. The beginning of the 19th century is the time where Protestantism start to fail and lost its historicist teaching to the world. The futurism of Ribera never posed a positive threat to the Protestants for three centuries. It was virtually confined to the Roman Catholic Church. But early in the 19th century it sprang forth with vehemence and latched on to Protestants in the established Church of England. This is taken from Dr. Ron Thompson, Champions of Christianity in Search of Truth. Dr. Samuel Roffey Maitland, who lived between 1792 and 1866, who was a British lawyer and Bible scholar, became a librarian to the Archbishop of Canterbury at Lambeth. It is likely that one day he discovered Ribera's commentary in the library. In any event, in 1826 he published a widely read book attacking the Reformation and supporting the Jesuit idea of a future Mr. Antichrist person. For the next 10 years, in tract after tract, he continued his anti-Reformation rhetoric. Well, the next 10 years, the author says, and I say 1829, we have the Emancipation Act, which gave the Roman Catholic Church an equal standing with Protestant churches again in good old England. And from 1833 and 1845, the Oxford movement um, that was uh, supported with Tractarianism fell right into this time frame. 
and that is the time frame when this futurism took place in England, where it first came into being. After Dr. Maitland came James H. Todd, professor of Hebrew at the University of Dublin. Giving credit to Maitland, Todd published his own futuristic pamphlets and books. Commenting on the views of Maitland and another so-called Protestant, Mr. Berg, E.B. Elliot reported how these two Protestant writers excused the papacy from any concern with the predicted anti-Christian apostasy. Now we come to the next player. This is an absolute devilish person. I'm speaking of John Henry Newman a converted Protestant who finally became not only a cardinal within the Roman Catholic Church during lifetime, but now, a few years ago, I think it was 2019, he was even sanctified. He was beatified in 2010 and he was sanctified in 2019. John Henry Newman. And for all the people who do not know who John Henry Newman is, I want to give a short explanation, open my browser and go into this video, uh, this video, this is a video of, uh, we just watched, and go into the explanation of uh, Wikipedia and show to you who John Henry Newman, here you have a bigger picture of him, I chose this one because it has the Antichrist in there, it has the uh, crucifix in there, which is of course a devilish portrayal of uh, Jesus on the cross. And you have the face of John Henry Newman here. Um, this article in Wikipedia is quite interesting and you can see how he was uh, elevated to after the beatification uh, officially proclaimed by Pope Benedict the 16th in 19th of September 2010. This is the picture that you see here. During his visit to the United Kingdom, his canonization, that is what I meant, his canonization was officially approved by Antichrist Pope Francis on February 12, 2019 and took place on October 13, 2019. And this is a very interesting article to read, especially over his early life and education. He is a Protestant that turned into Roman Catholicism. And those are very dangerous people. Do you have any comment on John Henry Newman, Tom? John Henry Newman uh, turned out to be one of the greatest assets of the, the Antichrist Church of Rome that England ever saw. And right at the very time when the Jesuit-led Counter-Reformation and their master-minded uh, super weapon called Futurism uh, began to be taught in the Protestant and evangelical seminaries and colleges, both in Europe and in England. This traitor to Christ assisted the Jesuit-led Counter-Reformation and Futurism to find a fertile ground in England and to promote uh, Roman Catholicism in England, a Protestant country. And... Uh, this is potentially what, what see, people say could happen in the United States. I say it's already happened. There are traitors of Christ who are the most popular Protestant and evangelical pastors. And if I named them all, you'd recognize all their names. And they're all traitors of Christ. They have abandoned the Protestant Reformation. They have condemned the Protestant Reformation and the Protestant reformers and all the martyrs of Jesus by simply adopting Roman Catholic eschatology called futurism. Because futurism denies that the papacy is, was, and ever was the, the uh, man of sin, the son of perdition. And it adopts the never before heard, uh, the, the unheard of idea that the Antichrist is not the Pope, but a single individual at the end of time. And so they've just single-handedly, uh, uh, you know, wiped out Protestantism. Protestantism, the two planks of Protestantism is Jesus is the Christ, the papacy is the Antichrist. 
and on the notion that the papacy, on the belief that, on the fact that the papacy is the Antichrist, the Protestant Reformation was born. Okay? It owes its life to the fact that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist. The Protestant reformers were unanimous in that, de in that claim. And as a result of their teaching and the printing press and their communication with the rest of quote-unquote Christians in Europe, the Roman Catholic Church was flooding out. Uh, people were flooding out of the Roman Catholic Church in droves. It looked for all practical purposes like the, like the Roman Catholic Church was going to wither away and blow away with the wind. And... Uh, so as a last-ditch effort, the papacy created the Jesuit order, a militia for the pope, to conquer Protestantism by any and every means, fair or foul. And the first thing they chose to do was to convene this long-awaited council, which, instead of making conciliatory inroads uh, of reparation or, or conciliation, or cooperation with the Protestants in reforming the Roman Catholic Church, they did the opposite. They declared an all-out war of annihilation against Protestantism. They issued 100 to 120 damnations for every Protestant doctrine and uh, literally made Protestantism universally recognized uh, by Roman Catholics as a damnable heresy and that every Protestant was a heretic and that it was no uh, sin to kill a heretic. Okay, so there was tremendous uh, hatred uh, from the Roman Catholic Church against Protestants, which is still uh, very, very evident when one uh, begins to study the subject. And uh, Henry Newman was just one of the warriors uh, uh, that the Vatican used against Protestantism in England because he was a high-ranking Protestant. And he betrayed Christ, he betrayed the Protestant Reformation, he betrayed the truth, and he joined the papacy. Became a Roman Catholic, was ev uh, eventually elevated to the status of a cardinal, and he did so much damage to Protestant England and the Protestant cause, and the spreading of futurism, that the Roman Catholic Church considered him to be one of the greatest warriors against Protestantism there ever was. They beatified him and eventually made him a saint in the Roman Catholic Church. They've elevated him to deified status in the Roman Catholic Church. He is one of the most recognizable names in Roman Catholicism and one of the most damnable heretics that ever drew a breath. An enemy of Christ. He's the, the associate of Antichrist, and uh, he's uh, one of the champions of futurism, one of the champions of Jesuitism and the Jesuit-led Counter-Reformation. And because they so successfully destroyed Protestantism in England, that destruction continued in the United States of America, and we're suffering the consequences of it today. Most people don't even recognize that this has happened, and that's why we make so much lengthy commentary on this most valuable book, and to help the listeners understand what Steve Wolberg is really telling you. Steve Wolberg has to keep the book within reasonable uh, length, but there's so much that's yet to be told about the, the, the destruction of Protestant England and Protestantism in the United States of America. And this is just one of many stories how the Jesuits destroyed Protestantism in England and the United States of America. One of the champions of Antichrist Roman Catholicism is John Henry Newman. The flames of hell will leap to receive him on Judgment Day. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, I think he has a quote-unquote friend in the Cardinal Wiseman who assisted him in erecting all the dioceses back in England, right, in the 1850s, That's right. as you read in, uh, what was it, uh, Roman Civil Liberty uh, by Roman James Civil A. Wiley? Liberty. Yes, yeah. Roman Civil Liberty by James A. Wiley shows how the Roman Catholicism, whenever it gets power and control in, in, in a country, they divide 
that nation up into jurisdictions that are overseen by the bishops. They're called dioceses. And they establish okay. a shadow government by that. That becomes the shadow government in every nation. You know, you hear all this talk all the time about a shadow government. They never put a name or a face on it. Well, it's in your face. It's visible. It's hidden in plain sight. It's the diocesan structure of the governing body of the Roman Catholic Church in every country, overseen by a bishop for every jurisdiction. And uh, they watch the government. They watch the civil, uh, the, the civil laws, and uh, they report to the Pope. That's, that's their business, to keep an eye, to make sure every king of every land obeys the Pope. And if they don't, these bishops and these cardinals go into action. That is just as much true in the United States as it is in any Roman Catholic country in the world. Okay, you're... Yeah, I just fell here the, on the name Pope Leo XIII because Pope Leo XIII ordained him to cardinal on May 12, 1879. And that just reminded me on uh, another... Uh, discussion we had, I think it was yesterday, where I brought up Pope Leo XIII, who had a meeting with the German Kaiser in 1903, the day of his death, when he told the German Kaiser that they have to, that Germany has to become the sort of the Roman Catholic Church. It's just interesting yeah. when you do these studies, how you again and again and again uh, stumble on the well, same names. And, and I can tell you from experience, the people listening to this program heard what you said but it still doesn't register. What you described is exactly how the papacy rules over the kings of the earth. This pope told the German uh, a chancellor that emperor, Germany, emperor. the German emperor was going to become the sword of the Roman Catholic Church. Now that's not rhetoric. That's not a suggestion. That is a declaration. That is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in Rome telling one of his subjects, you will become the sword of the Roman Catholic Church. And that's exactly what Germany did. Now, now stop and think. How many times do you suppose the popes of Rome have said to the presidents of the United States, you will become the sword of the Roman Catholic Church. Would that explain most of the United States military police force around the world and all the police actions and all of the regime changes and all of the declared and undeclared wars of the United States in the modern era? I'm telling you, that's exactly what it is. That the United States is no less the sword of the Roman Catholic Church, as was Germany before their defeat by the United States in 1945. The sword simply passed from defeated Germany to victorious United States of America, which had by then become thoroughly futurist. And the presidency knew that the Protestants of this land, though they would appear to be in opposition to the papacy, had literally abandoned their very foundation for existence and denied that the papacy is the Antichrist, believing in a future single individual. So Protestants had undermined their own foundation. They had undermined their own authority. They had become laughingstocks uh, according to the Roman Catholic Church and according to the government of the United States, and witless dupes, they became witless dupes in fighting crusade after crusade after crusade to restore the papacy to its original <laughs> dominant status. The very thing that Germany was raised up to do, the United States is now still in the business of elevating the papacy to world supremacy. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom. Um, that is a very interesting point to discuss maybe a little bit deeper on some other uh, 
occasions, but today. But uh, John Henry Newman was first an Anglican priest, and that means he was a quote-unquote Protestant, and later a Catholic priest and cardinal, and his major writings include the Tracts for the Times, in the time between 1833 and 1841. Now, this is a very important time between 1833 and 1841, because you see here the Oxford Movement, the book written by Richard William Church, took time between the 12 years, 1833 and 1845. Now, no, this is not a joke of mine. This is really the times that happened. Do you think it is a coincidence that 1933 to 1945 is the duration of the reign of the, <laughs> of the Third Reich in Germany. <laughs> and just a hundred years before, by the Oxford movement, you had Oxford movement, you had the establishment of the Roman Catholic Church back in the, uh, in, in the UK. <laughs> I don't think there's any coincidence in there. But Henry uh, Newman wrote his tract in the time between 1833 and 1841, so that falls completely in the time of the Oxford movement, which gave the Roman Catholic Church back its power that it had lost all through the Protestant reign of England for the last few hundred years after the... Um, after the gunpowder plot. Yeah, after, after, after the, the reign of Elizabeth already in the 16th Spanish century. Yeah, yeah, we had, yeah. Uh, we had uh, Queen Elizabeth reign in England between 1558 and 1603. Uh, the longest reigning queen up to Elizabeth II now, who probably overtook her, uh, I think. Uh, but she was a uh, Protestant queen, and uh, many attacks on her country were made during her reign, among others, the, uh, not only the Spanish Armada attack on England, but also the Babington plot, and then later on her son, uh, King James I, um, who you know, of course, from the King James Bible, uh, the gunpowder plot. Yeah, very, very interesting history uh, of uh, quote-unquote good old England and how that Protestant country, with the works of John Henry Newman, and we have to mention this, Tom, by the works of John Henry Newman, Protestant England fell. And the Roman Catholic Church always said, if Protestantism is erased out of England, it is over one in all the world. Yep. Yeah, if they could destroy Protestantism in England, then Protestantism would die everywhere. Yeah, that's what I wanted to say. Yeah. Okay, let's continue a little bit in this book. You see how interesting it is to mix this up with other history out of the same times. Yeah. So, next player, John Henry Newman, who lived between 1801 and 1890, a member of the Church of England and a leader of the famous Oxford movement. In 1850, Newman wrote his letter on Anglican difficulties, blatantly revealing that one of the goals of the movement was to lead, quote, the various English denominations and parties, unquote, back to Rome. Now, I can tell you here from what I wrote, uh, what I read in the memoirs of the German Kaiser, Wilhelm II, that Henry Newman, as a clergyman, was doing the same thing that the German Kaiser did in the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century in Germany. Putting all the different Protestant denominations under one hat to then lead them back to Rome. Because you know kind when like you have council churches today. Yeah, yeah. You know when you have twenty or twenty-five different churches, you cannot pick one and lead that to Rome, and then pick the never the next and lead that to Rome. First, you have to unite all these twenty-five churches into one organization, and then you take that one organization and you lead it back to Rome. And what culminated in the Second Vatican Council between 18, uh, 1963 and 1965 was already begun in the 19th century because these That's guys right. plan at least a hundred years in advance. That's right. It's not a quote-unquote coincidence that that happened. It is not a quote-unquote coincidence that John Henry Newman worked on that ecumenism in England, that the German Kaiser worked on the ecumenism in Germany. It is 
blatantly in your eyes if you study history it was obvious it was to be planned to come out to what the second vatican council was and the second vatican council was to use tom's words not nothing else but the capitulation of protestantism worldwide that's right that's right the war was the vatican with vatican council II. the vatican was literally declaring the war over that they had won that they had conquered protestantism and uh, the protestants had basically committed uh, s spiritual suicide by believing in futurism a future antichrist yeah a little bit like kenneth copeland and tony palmer did you know that's right when tony palmer said the protest is over yeah that's what was literally declared at vatican council ii in 1965 and so uh, uh the armistice was in the process of being signed and with that an ultimatum come back to the mother church or else convert or die convert or die that's rome's standard strategy and i believe though no protestant pastor is going to admit it i believe the protestant pastors understood the ultimatum they understood that they had they had surrendered their own foundation they understood that in believing in a future antichrist they had exonerated the papacy and but thereby had it had damned the protestant reformation as a grievous error against the legitimate head of the christian church in the world the papacy which is in fact the antichrist and and they knew the power of Rome. All of history demonstrated the power of Rome once she's defeated her enemies. They take no prisoners. You either come back to the Roman Catholic Church, lock, stock, and barrel, or you die. And the Protestant pastors have kept it quiet ever since Vatican Council II, what was actually determined at Vatican Council II. It was, an, it was a declaration of victory, VE Day over Protestantism, and also the 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 the, uh, uh, the consequences of turning over all of Europe away from the papacy was reparation, or else. And the government of the United States was in cooperation with the Vatican on this. And so the pa the Protestant pastors kept quiet about what was really taking place. Never told any of the of the parishioners any of the any of the pew sitters. What was really going on? Now, Tom, many we people ask themselves. Many, many people ask themselves, maybe, Tom, why did the Protestant preachers keep quiet? Because they were the seminaries of the Protestant preachers, pastors, were infiltrated by the Jesuits from the beginning of the 19th century. Yeah. Well, they they knew that they had sold the farm to the Vatican when they adopted futurism. Look, if they came clean to the Protestant, uh, the Protestant people of this country, we would have demanded their heads. They were between a rock and a really hard place. And to save their own necks, they kept quiet about what Vatican Council II really was all about. They kept quiet about what futurism was really all about. It was about destroying the very foundation of the Protestant Reformation. And the answer of that is obvious to everyone. You have to come back to the Roman Catholic Church. And all of history demonstrates what happens when the Vatican uh, vanquishes her Protestant or heretic, heretic enemies and they don't come back to the Roman Catholic Church. Half a third of them are exiled. A third of them are forcibly converted to Roman Catholicism and a third of them are liquidated by the most heinous means of human destruction one can devise. A good example Rome of that. The same strategy. Divide the heretics into three segments. A third are forcibly converted to Roman Catholicism. A third are exiled out of the country. A third are annihilated. A very good example of that, Tom, is uh, the uh, 
independent state of Croatia during the Second World That's War exactly between 1941 right. and 1945 with the Ustasha. Yep. Yeah. And they did exactly that. They did exactly that what you just said. As a matter of fact, Avro Manhattan acknowledged what they did in Croatia, and he said that what the Roman Catholic Church did in Croatia was a model for what they intended to do in the United States of America. A blueprint, if you will. Yes, that was a blueprint, a, a trial uh, uh, to see how, how well it would go in the United States. And that that's what... Our, our Protestant pastors were literally faced with. And without our knowledge, they capitulated to the Roman Catholic Church. Every one of the most famous, most recognizable names in Protestant and evangelicalisms are traitors of Christ. They are traitors of Christians. And most people would, would take what I've just said and say, well, it's too late. We've lost. We've lost the war. <laughs> not on your life. As long as we have Jesus Christ, Tom, we That's, never lose any war. That's exactly right. And it's time for us to saddle up. It's time for us to armor up. It's time for us to say no capitulation to Rome. We will not serve Antichrist. We will not claim Jesus out of one side of our mouth and then serve Antichrist with our hands and our feet. The Protestant betrayers of Christ can go shuffle off the buffalo. They need to be retired, willingly or unwillingly. And we need to get on with the Protestant Reformation and take our place with the martyrs of Jesus if necessary. Eventually, the meek will inherit this earth. The battle is not over. It's not going to be over until Jesus issues the last stroke. That hasn't happened yet. And I'm still in this fight, and I'm going to be in this fight Till God takes my last breath. And when after the judgment, I'll be with the saints when, he re when we return to take this inheritance. And judgment will be given to the saints, not to the Roman Catholics. Back to you, Yerk. And we're going to take what righteously belongs to us. Okay, let's continue. The Oxford tracks gave fresh weight to anti-protestant opinions, gave assistance to the laborers of the Futurist School, worked to unprotestantize the Church of England and, quote, set aside all application to the Roman papacy of the fearful prophecies respecting Antichrist, unquote. After publishing his own pamphlet about a future Mr. Sinister, John Henry Newman himself became a Catholic and later a highly honored cardinal. So, here I prepared a little comment where I wrote, Newman's beatification was officially proclaimed by Pope Benedict XVI on, 9, on September 19, 2010, as I already read from the Wikipedia page, during his visit to the United Kingdom, and his canonization was officially approved by Antichrist Pope Francis on the 12th of February 2019 and took place on October 13, 2019. So you see how highly venerated this Cardinal Newman is, and they would not venerate him that high if his work would not have been that important as it was. Through the combined influences of Maitland, Todd, Burke, Newman and others, and I mentioned, for example, Cardinal Wiseman, a definite, quote, Romeward movement had arisen, destined to sweep away the old Protestant landmarks as with a flood. The virus was sneaking in. Now, we're going to have another picture here. Then came the Scottish Presbyterian minister Edward Irving, who lived between 1792 and 1834, who pastored the large 
Chalcedonian, Chalcedonian, sorry, Chalcedonian Chapel in London with over 1,000 members. Co-founder of the Society for the Investigation of Prophecy, Irving eventually accepted the one-man antichrist idea of Newman, Burke, Todd, Maitland, Bellarmine and Ribera, yet he went a step further. Somewhere around 1830, Edward Irving began to teach the novel idea of a two-phase return of Christ. The first phase being a secret rapture before the rise of Antichrist. Where he got his, this concept is a matter of hot dispute. Christian journalist Dave, Dave McPherson has researched this matter for many years. In his investigative books, The Rapture Plot, and I'm going to show you a picture of that right here, that is The Rapture Plot, and the other book, The Incredible Cover-Up, and I also have a picture of that, that is here, Mr. McPherson suggests Irving snatched it from a young Scottish lassie named Margaret MacDonald, who first, quote-unquote, saw it during an ecstatic, uh, exact, ecstatic, <laughs> excuse me, who saw it during an ecstatic, quote-unquote, revelation. Regardless of where Irving got it, the fact is, he taught it. In the yeah, midst, there's where the rapture candy comes from. That's where the icing of the cake comes from. That's the icing on the cake. That's what makes people so reluctant to spit out of their mouth futurism. Because indelibly attached to this most diabolical false teaching of futurism is what has become known in the Protestant evangelical world as the great hope, the rapture of the church. And, and if, you, if, you, if you deny futurism, then you must deny the rapture. And that's why people are so reluctant to deny futurism. Because hermetically attached to it is this cockamamie idea of the rapture. Listen, there's going to be a catching away. There's absolutely no doubt about it. It's called the resurrection of the righteous. But there's only one resurrection of the righteous. And it's not in secret. And that's on the last day when the trumpet shall sound and the dead of Christ shall rise. And then we which are alive and remain should be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. That's the resurrection of the righteous. Look, they, they preach this idea that the last trump is going to come and then the rapture is going to happen. But what about the resurrection? Is there two last trumps? Obviously not. There's only one last trump. God's not the author of confusion. This whole idea of a secret catching away prior to the resurrection of the righteous is made up. It was first seen in a vision by this ecstatic little lassie, this little Scottish lassie named Margaret MacDonald, who saw it in an ecstatic vision and talked about it, and Irving, being caught up in all the prestige of being the head of this great uh, 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 eschatological, the prophecy seminars that have become so famous and, and popular in the United States of America, were started back in Irving's time in England. And he was the chief of it. He was the head prognosticator, the head visionary, the head prophet of these prophecy conferences in, in England. And he picked up this little girl's vision and he taught it as if it was fact. And there's no truth to it. And it was attached directly to the, to the 
to the futurist interpretation of Daniel's prophecy that Jesus didn't fulfill the 70th week of Daniel 2,000 years ago. The Antichrist at the end of time is going to fulfill the 70th week of Daniel. But before that happens, either before or mid-tribulation or post-tribulation, this rapture is going to take place. And all of that before the resurrection of the righteous. Look, If you put chocolate frosting on a pile of hooey, it's still hooey. You better spit out the chocolate frosting so as not to get any hooey in your mouth. That's my advice to everyone who calls himself a Protestant or an evangelical in this country. Spit it out, all of it. Because it's all straight from the pit. It's designed to kill you. And it already has. There's not a hint of true Protestantism left in this country. As a percentage of the so-called Christian world, there isn't but a handful who still believe in historicism, the historical interpretation of Daniel's prophecy that says Jesus was the one who fulfilled the 70th week of Daniel. He did it perfectly and completely 2,000 years ago. And, by the way, the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist. He was revealed not long after Christ's crucifixion, just like Paul preached the restrainer was taken out of the way. The Caesars of Rome, the government of Rome was taken out of the way. And Rome simply morphed from the pagan Roman Empire to the papal Roman Empire. That was the time when Antichrist was first revealed to the world, just like Paul prophesied. You don't have a future antichrist you have a historical antichrist and he's just as much the antichrist today as he was back then he's just as much the antichrist today as he will be when he's destroyed by christ's second coming learn the truth and your protestant foundations are intact. Restore historicism and the Protestant Reformation and know the truth. Back to you, Yerk. On a little side note for what probably many people will start to hate me, when I first read the sentence of uh, Mr. McPherson suggests Irving snatched it from a young Scottish lassie named Margaret MacDonald who first quote-unquote, saw it during an ecstatic, quote-unquote, revelation, I myself couldn't help me thinking of E.G. White and her visions, quote-unquote. Look, I'm, I'm, surrounded, I'm surrounded in all sides of all my family with visionaries, dreamers, uh, tongue speakers. They think they get direct revelation from the Lord. They never check to see if it's contrary to the Scriptures. And they believe lies. They're easily deceived. And most of my deception came from them. I honored, worshipped, and obeyed my mother. Okay? And it was nothing but error. Error after error after error. Now I know better. The scriptures are our authority. Not direct revelation. Not dreams and visions, not ecstatic utterances, not dreams. Satan is a deceiver, and that's how he deceives God's people, by giving them so-called revelations and images and visions that are not substantiated in the Scriptures. And uh, we're to be good Bereans. And, 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 and pass everything through the scriptures to see if it's so. 
We've long since abandoned that with the with the, the, the rise of the charismatic movement and this idea of direct revelation from the so-called Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not a deceiver. The Holy Spirit tells nothing but the truth. And he never deviates from the scriptures. So if the scripture doesn't talk about it, the Holy Spirit, if the, if the scripture doesn't talk about it, the Holy Spirit's not going to talk about it. And if any so-called Holy Spirit reveals something to you that can't be refer, uh, confirmed in the scripture, then you better spit it out of your mouth. Okay? I'm hated by every member of my family for this belief of mine. But it's tried and it's true. And I'm not going to repent of it. The charismatic movement and all these dreamers and visionaries are no better than this great deceiver, Margaret McDonald, who come up with this vision about, uh, you know, in one of her ecstatic uh, utterances, one of her trances, much like those of Ellen G. White, that just aren't true. They just are not true. And the consequences of believing these deceivers is incalculable. Incalculable. Get your mind wrapped around the truth. Back to you, Yerk. I share every word of that belief that you just stated, Tom. Now we come to another person, probably even more diabolical than the ones we already had. In the midst of this growing anti-Protestant climate in England came the man we talked about in Chapter 6 already of this book, John Nelson Darby, who lived between 1800 and 1882. A brilliant lawyer, pastor and theologian, I'm sorry to say he didn't use his brilliance for the good of God, he used his brilliance for the agenda of the devil. Darby wrote more than 53 books on Bible subjects. Ellen G. White someone? <laughs> How many books did she write? <laughs> On the positive side, he staunchly defended the infallibility of the scriptures against British liberalism and soon became one of the leaders of an English group called the Plymouth Brethren. Darby's contribution to the development of evangelical theology has been so great that he has been called the quote-unquote, I say, father of modern dispensationalism. Don't call anyone father, but only he who is in heaven is your father, right? Yet John Nelson Darby, like Edward Irving, not only became a champion for the pre-tribulation rapture idea, some say he grabbed it from Irving, others say he found it on his own, but also of a future Antichrist who appears only after we disappear. Both teachings, a secret rapture and a future Mr. Ghastly, are now dispensational pillars. You cannot do without those two pillars. Reporting on Irving and Darby's rapture, then Antichrist views, Macpherson wrote, quote, Into this futurist system both Darby and Irving had injected a further refinement, based upon a declared attempt to reconcile the different parts of the New Testament, which they considered to be relevant. In their view, the second advent would take place in two stages. First, there would be a quiet appearance, the quote-unquote presence of Christ, when all true Christians, the true church, would be removed from the earth. This was the, quote, rapture of the saints, unquote. Only then, when the restraining presence of the Holy Spirit in his own people had been removed from the world scene, would Antichrist arise. His rule would be brought to an end by the second stage of the Advent, the public appearing of Christ in glory. This is taken from the incredible cover-up book where you already saw the picture. I leave John Nelson Darby here 
And I think we are going to come to an end for our broadcast today. And I think that Tom still has something to say about what I just read here. This is so important because where in the Bible does it ever speak of a secret two-stage coming of Jesus Christ? First, in the quote-unquote quiet appearance, the presence of Christ when all true Christians and the church would be removed from the earth. Where is that in the Bible? Where is this quote-unquote rapture of the saints in the Bible? As Tom already said, there is only the resurrection and the in, the in the twinkling of an eye, changing of the righteous who are here and alive at that moment of Jesus Christ coming back. Nothing else is to be found in the Bible. But I want to leave it to Tom for a final comment on what I just read. And then we're going to continue next week in the 51st part and discussion of this reading. Mm. Please, Tom. Well, there were a lot of people that picked up uh, this futurist teaching that originated in the Roman Catholic Church. It originated in the Roman Catholic Church, the idea that the papacy is not the Antichrist. It's a single individual. Okay? That's the ancient old teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church has never admitted and never will admit that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist. Makes sense, doesn't it? So they had to put the onus on someone else. And they did it, apparently, it, they claim at least, to have shed the onus, the blame of Antichrist, away from the papacy and onto one of the ancient Roman Caesars, Nero, or Caligula, or Hadrian, or one of them. And if, you, if that's just too outrageous to believe and you just can't wrap your brain around that, well, they got another opportunity for you. You can believe in futurism. A single individual that doesn't come on the world stage till just before Christ. And in either case, you've exonerated the papacy. You see how childish and simple it is to understand who the author of futurism is? And now you take the Protestant, the the the, the uh, the Protestant seminaries are teaching this cockamamie futurist baloney in the most prestigious Protestant and evangelical seminaries in this country. Now every Protestant uh, pastor regurgitates this diabolical soup. Futurism. It's preached morning, noon, and night. And they recreated these prophecy conferences all over this country to propagate this futurist delusion. They so much love this delusion. Why? Because they make millions and millions and millions of dollars with it. It's easier to sell lies than it is to go out and get a job. Okay? Money's what it's all about, honey. There are no true Protestant pastors left in this country. They're all in it for the fame and fortune and money. They are the hireling. The Bible plainly calls them what they are, hireling. Can you expect a hireling to be just as concerned about the flock as the owner, the shepherd? No, they're in it for the money. And Charles Nelson Darby was just a Jesuit-controlled Freemason who brought this futurist load of crap to this country and produced the Nelson, uh, the, you know, passed along his futurist garbage to uh, uh, the one who, who, the Schofield reference Bible, Cyrus Schofield. Cyrus Schofield was a protege or a futurist protege of John Nelson Darby. Together they spread this garbage in this country and uh, it, 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 you know, you 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 ask a Baptist pastor, well, what should I, I become a, a, a Christian? What Bible should I buy? Well, they'll always recommend a Charles Nelson Darby uh, Bible or a or a Cyrus Schofield Bible. Why? Because in the in the, in the commentaries in these Bibles, they promote the futurist interpretation of Daniel's seventieth week. They deny that Jesus fulfilled the 70th week of Daniel. They say the future Antichrist is going to fulfill it. 
Now, you can't get more screwed up than that. But that's what they'll tell you. Go out and get yourself a Cyrus Schofield Bible. That's what they want you to get, a Cyrus Schofield reference Bible. And that's what has single-handedly condemned the entire Baptist denomination. There's no truth-telling Baptist church in this country. They're all futurists. And it was passed down to the charismatics, and the evangelical churches are all futurists. There isn't a historicist church in this country. You cannot find the truth in a church in this country. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not overstating this. But, but, but Tom, we love our pastor. We have such wonderful friends in our church. We love to go to church every Sunday. We just love, How can they be so evil and wicked like you say? They're not evil and wicked. They're deceived. And they will not repent because they love the rapture candy so much. They don't care who the Antichrist is. Why? Because they're going to be raptured out before he ever comes. You see how you've been handcuffed? You've been hogtied, spiritually hogtied. You've become lethargic. You've become waiting on a dead hope. There's no rapture. The righteous shall, as always, suffer persecution, even until Christ comes. Okay? And who is the persecutor? The historical Antichrist. The papacy, the one who rules over the kings of the earth today, yesterday, and tomorrow. And isn't it interesting, Yerk has put up this, this picture of, of this book, this mo the most deceptive pieces of literature produced in our generation, The Coming Prince by Sir Robert Anderson of England. Good old Protestant England. The same Protestant England that produced John Henry Newman also produced Sir Robert Anderson, who said the 70th week of Daniel is future. It was never fulfilled in the history. That's the rare, the, the, the rare substantiation for futurism. That book is cited by every futurist pastor, The Coming Prince by Sir Robert Anderson, one of the greatest deceptions ever to be produced to deceive God's people. This Sir Robert Anderson claims to have counted the days from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, and uh, it stopped at the end of the 69th week. He counted the days, he says. And the 69th week is yet unfinished, unfulfilled. Don't you believe it? You want to know if the 70th and final week of Daniel's prophecy is fulfilled? First of all, go to Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27, and read it for yourself, and then read the New Testament. In the New Testament, from beginning to end, is the proof positive, detailed, historical account of the perfect and complete fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy, particularly the 70th and final week. That's what the New Testament is all about. It records the historical fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel a seven-year period of time, and it will knock your socks off. It will put to shame every futurist pastor in this country. And that's just what needs to happen. Retire every futurist pastor in this country. They've sold us down the ecumenical river. They've sold us down the primrose path to perdition. They've sold us as slaves to the Antichrist of Rome. That's what we can expect of the hirelings told about in the scriptures. 
Your love and infatuation with your future as pastor is misplaced. Repent before it's too late. I'll see you next time. The President DeJoya's invitation started me thinking about the many similarities between Jesuits and News Corporation. Uh, but both the Jesuits and News Corporation attract highly talented people from all over the globe. Both the Jesuits and News Corporation like to challenge the status quo. And both the Jesuits and News Corporation have a reputation for independence and innovation. Of course, there are some differences. I don't want to discourage anyone who might be considering the priesthood. Uh, but I will tell you that at News Corporation, we don't insist on vows of poverty or chastity. Um, and as chief executive, I can tell you that I'm sometimes not sure about the degree of obedience either. Uh, the Earth Summit Environmental Leadership Act, as this is known, presents us with an opportunity to follow up on the important work of the Earth Summit to develop its blueprint, Agenda 21, for envir global environmental action. DUP leader Ian Paisley was jostled, punched and then dragged out of the European Parliament today after interrupting a speech by the Pope. The disturbance came within seconds of the Pope starting to speak. Other Euro MPs responded angrily when Dr Paisley heckled the Pope, saying he was the Antichrist. Permit me to say how much I... Paisley, I call you to order and I ask you to stop this disturbance. For the second time, Mr. Paisley, for the second time, Mr. Paisley, I call you to order and I ask you to respect the dignity of this House. Mr. Paisley, I now exclude you from this house and for the remainder of the city. Mr. Paisley claims he was punched and that he later received a personal apology from the head of security for failing to protect him. The poster stated simply, John Paul II Antichrist, a reference to the view supported by Archbishop Cranmer in Reformation times that by claiming to be God's earthly representative, popes have usurped the position of Christ. He remained unrepentant despite being accused of being a bigot. But let me say this, if the honor of Christ is at stake, I would put my whole political career on the line for the honor of Jesus Christ in this group. I happen to be a Protestant by conviction, and I'm not going to sell my Protestant heritage.